1919, several children at a hospital in central Paris were suffering from severe dysentery caused by a bacterial infection of the intestines and resulting in severe diarrhoea. However, a microbiologist, Felix Durel, was ready to trial a new treatment. Three years prior, in 1916, Durel was an unpaid self-taught volunteer at the Pasteur Institute and searching for a discovery to place his name in the history books alongside Pasteur himself. He isolated bacteriophages, viruses that attack bacteria, from the filtrates of dysentery fluids from soldiers. He immediately speculated that his discovery could explain the recovery of patients from the disease. And in early 1919, he had begun conducting trial experiments on animals, isolating phage from chicken feces and successfully treating a plague of chicken typhus. With that success, he was now ready to begin human trials. His treatment of several children at the hospital was successful and promised to herald the beginning of a new medical revolution. But today, few bacterial infections are treated with phage therapy. Instead, physicians turn to antibiotics, but with the rise of superbugs, resistant to many antibiotics, perhaps bacteriophages could be useful. So why did they fall out of use in the first place? The short answer as to why antibiotics became preferred over phage is one of convenience and money. Phage is specific, targeting only a few bacterial species. And while this can be beneficial in leaving helpful bacterial species untouched, a broad-spectrum antibiotic wiping clean all species of bacteria can cure an infection regardless of what specific species is the culprit, thus allowing for presumptive treatment prior to the identification of the pathogen. And the new sulfanoamide antibiotics of the 1930s were easy to use by solo general practitioners without the access to expensive bacteriological laboratories needed for the diagnosis and complex support necessary for effective phage therapy. Off-the-shelf medications were simple and effective, and naturally occurring phage cannot be patented, so pharmaceutical companies naturally followed the money, rather than endeavour to isolate new phages faster than bacteria evolved resistance. But while we can summarise that the widespread availability of antibiotics after the Second World War has reduced the use of phage therapy, the issues faced began at the moment of discovery. Even the very nature of phage was the subject of debate. In 1919, the same year that Durrell first treated patients with phage, Julie Baudet was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on immunity, based on the lysis of bacteria by antibodies, not phage. Durrell boldly challenged Baudet's work, and with that an academic rivalry was born. Baudet and his protege, André Grazia, responded by challenging both his conception of phage as a virus, arguing that bacterial lysis was induced by an enzyme, and his status as discoverer, noting that Frederick Twart, a British microbiologist, had observed transmissible glassy transformation of bacteria, but failed to follow up on his original observations. Durrell fought back as best he could, but with no formal scientific education, and lacking the standings of a Nobel Prize, he couldn't persuade the scientific community that phage was a virus, and not a self-perpetuating lytic enzyme. Nevertheless, the medical results couldn't be ignored, and doctors across Western Europe successfully tested phage therapy against a variety of diseases. And in 1924, Durrell received an honorary doctorate from the University of Leiden, as well as the Leeuwenhoek Medal, placing him alongside his idol, Louis Pasteur. But it was not until the electron microscope was developed in Germany in 1939 that Durrell's viral conception of phage would be vindicated. And even then, World War II limited the distribution of scientific literature out of Germany. And the then known status of phage as a virus led to a marketing issue. Both scientists and the public alike were intrigued by the virus at the edge of life, but patients could be off-put by a treatment involving a living agent. Regardless, by this point, Durrell had left the West to help establish an institute to study phage and phage therapy in the Soviet Republic of Georgia in 1934. Without the profit requirements of capitalism, phage therapy was widely employed in the Soviet Union, who also lacked access to the antibiotics being developed in the West. This operation became large, employing 1,200 people and producing two tons of phage each week, mostly for use by the Soviet military. However, this resulted in another marketing issue. In the aftermath of World War II, with the Cold War governing international relations, all things communist became suspect in the West. This included Soviet science, and phage therapy was now Soviet science, as Gunther Stent, 
one of the early bacteriophage biologists and graduate professor at the University of California in Berkeley, wrote his phage therapy was fading into obscurity. As late as World War II, bacteriophages were said to have found employ in the medical services of the German and Japanese armies. And even today, the medical use of bacteriophages still persists in some out-of-the-way places. Being associated with America's enemies, especially the out-of-the-way places understood at the time to be the Soviet Union, resulted in phage therapy becoming something to be quickly dismissed. But now, with the rise of superbugs, interest in phage therapy is increasing. Phage not only provide an opportunity as an alternative treatment for antibiotic-resistant bacteria, but modified viruses could turn the Cas9 protein the bacteria normally uses to defend itself against the bacteria to make modifications to the bacteria's own genome with CRISPR, potentially solving the problem of bacterial resistance to the phage, as well as allowing patents. And speaking of CRISPR, my wife made a video on the medical uses of this technique over on her channel, Crazy Little Things. So go check it out, links in all the usual places.